I want to give you an announcement. Some of you are just come on the Sunday evenings, and so to let you know you don't hear the Sunday morning announcements, this Saturday is the uh, annual chili cook-off, and so it's just a great day of fellowship and wonderful things happening. And uh, so there's information about that chili cook-off available at the information counter out in the fellowship hall of brochure that gives you all of the details and and so be aware of that, one of the fellowship highlights, uh, really, of the year. All right, Deuteronomy, Sunday nights through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We pick things up tonight in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let me get my stopwatch going. Very, very important. Not just for me, but for all speakers. It's interesting that uh, Moses, as he is, when we catch him here in chapter 11, he is... Um, in sermon two of a five sermon series in the in the book of Deuteronomy on the theme of obedience to the second generation of the children of Israel as they are on the east side of the Jordan immediately opposite Jericho. And uh, it's interesting that Moses, second sermon will go all the way through chapter 26. It's a long sermon. So you could go to kind of a conference and he's speaking. You could have a 15-minute sermon, six-hour sermon, 30-minute sermon. And so this is what we find ourselves in the middle of, the great theme of obedience. And Moses declared to this generation that was about to go in and possess the promised land. He said, therefore, you shall love the Lord your God. And so how can we practically express our love toward the Lord and keep his charge his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments. And so the importance of expressing our love toward the Lord through obedience. Love and obedience are inseparable in our relationship with the Lord. And Jesus said much the same. He said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. It is the very best way to express our love not only toward the Lord, but really toward anyone. And I think anyone that's been a parent was, has probably said that. If, certainly if you've raised the children through the teenage years, you've said, listen, if you love me, would you just do what I'm telling you? That's the best way that you don't say it to me anymore. Just obey my commandments. And so, so it is in our relationship with the Father and with Jesus, it is the best way to express our worship toward him or our love toward him. And then it allows him to appreciate all the other ways that we express our love to him. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arms, his signs and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt and to all of his land. And so what Moses is talking about here is he's telling them, in essence, listen, this theme of obedience or the subject of obedience don't let it just go in one ear and out the other. Now, we've been a little while in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, so it's easy to think, okay, obedience, obedience, obedience. Why so much repetition? Why is this so important to God? And the tendency can just be to think it just goes in one ear and it goes out the other. God repeats the theme of obedience because he knows, number one, we need to hear it. Only he knows how much obedience he sees on a given day in, in the world. But the, they are a group of people. It's the second generation. The first generation has died in the wilderness. These people have a history with God. So, and they have a history with God that has taught them two things and a lesson from those two things. One of the things that they have learned is when they have obeyed God, it has resulted in a life of blessing. And so this is why he references Egypt. Look at all of the blessings that came your way just through simple obedience to the word of God. Then he's going to bring up Korah and Dathan and Abiram in verse 6 in just a moment, which was a little chapter in their life in which they chose to disobey the Lord and things went uh, sideways, to say the least, they went poorly. So they have a history with God where if they haven't learned anything else, they should have learned this by this time, and that is to obey God leads to blessing, uh, allows him to bless us in the way that he wants to, and to disobey him uh, leads to trouble. So the lesson is, let's obey him 
and not disobey him. So that's the point he's driving through. His signs and his acts, verse 3, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his land. What he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day for what he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place. It's been you obey and has been nothing but blessing. That's everybody's testimony. And what he did now as he heads to kind of the neg negative thing, they were eyewitnesses that disobedience led to judgment. And what he did, Moses reminds him, what God did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. And so they had seen when Korah and these gentlemen had led a rebellion against Moses, against Aaron and their authority, uh, God had kind of a zero tolerance for that, and he swallowed them up. And so he said, you see, disobedience has always ended rather poorly, and so how important it is to obey and not disobey. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. And so uh, this, it, this theme of obedience, importance of obedience, it determines our futures. It determines God's ability to bless us. Therefore, in the light of this, therefore is a reason word, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today. Every commandment from God's a good command. And, and, and they're, they're righteous and they're wonderful. The Bible says that the commands of the Lord, they're not burdensome. They're, they're life-giving. They, they produce freedom in our life. Therefore, you shall keep every command which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. And so God, he's, he's going to just speak right now and say, your obedience, Moses is saying, your obedience allows God to bless you in the way that he wants to bless you. And number one, he's going to talk about is going to allow God to give you Canaan, the promised land, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God uh, swore to give, which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey for the land which you go in to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you came or come where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from uh, the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And so God tells Moses, speaks to them and says, your obedience allows God to give you this promised land. And boy, you'd think that Moses was in real estate as he describes this land. He said, this land that God's given to you, it's better than the land of Egypt. Well, the land of Egypt at that time was the envy of the world. I mean, Egypt, the Nile River, the Delta, all of that land that could be used for agriculture to feed their people, the wealth, the prosperity that came from it. I mean, and here is God talking about Canaan, Israel, being something that's even better than Egypt. And it was. It's the best real estate in all of the Middle East. And one of the reasons that he brings out here is in the land of Egypt is fairly flat, the land that's associated with uh, the Nile River, very large delta areas. And so in their agriculture that they do, they have this uh, these berms that they put up that maybe a foot or so high or whatever, uh, whatever height that would necessary around the property. And then when they would irrigate from the Nile, uh, a person would have to ha make a break in the berm of the land. The water supply might be over here, a flooded field that's next door to theirs or next to a tributary kind of of the Nile River and you would uh, in order to get the water from there into your property right now around here we just open up the the canals here and the water gushes in because of the systems that we have today to to flood the fields for agriculture but in those days a guy would have to sit on what looked essentially like a, a stationary bike 
But instead of a wheel, it would be paddles, and he would paddle the wheels, and it would paddle water into the field. Now, that's effective. I mean, there's no complaints about that. It's interesting. We've uh, been in India a couple times and seen that out in the fields. You see men in different places around a field. They are paddling these wheels in order to bring water, irrigation water, into a field. Now, that's great because you can get a crop out of it, and it's, it's wonderful. But there's something better than that. And the something better than that is not just having a piece of land that's just absolutely flat, but to have land that's got mountains and hills. <laughs> just kidding. If you're not from Modesto, you don't understand. But we're an hour from everywhere. Just remember that. That's the that's a slogan, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll t- what makes this city is the people. You know it and I know it. So, but the, here you've got hills, you've got mountains, and God said, you don't have to do any paddling. He said, I'll water your land for you. I'm taking you into land. I'll do the irrigation. I'll sprinkle the lawn for you. I'll sprinkle the crops for you. That's the kind of land that you're going into. So it can't get better than Egypt. It gets a lot better than, than Egypt. And so uh, the Lord spoke to them about the blessing of this. Verse 12 is, is a, a wonderful verse. And if you ever are able to get to Israel, it's one of the verses, I think, that comes to everyone's mind. And that recognition while you're there that the Lord's eyes are uh, on that land from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year in kind of a special way. Of course, you know, when you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit as a Christian, you know, nothing tops that. And it shall be, verse 13, he talks about blessing them. He's in telling them your obedience allows God to give you the very best land in the, in the Middle East there. And then it's going to allow him uh, on top of that to, to prosper you in terms of your crop and your flocks and these kind of things. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain, which is uh, October, November, and the latter rain, which is uh, uh, March, April. So the early rain would come in and it would allow the seed to germinate. The later rain would come in and you're going to have rain in between the two seasons. But these two key periods of rain would would assure uh, a, a very, very abundant flock. So he promises, if you obey me, I'll give you the early rain. I'll give you the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. So I'll, I'll give you enough rain to bless your um, your uh, agricultural endeavors so you have plenty of food. I know there are farmers in this room. Imagine the blessing of being told by God. All right. No irrigation systems. None of this. None of this. None of this dry farming. And God comes in and says, listen, you go into that land and you obey me. And I don't want you to even think about the weather. I don't want you to worry about the weather. I don't want you to be concerned about the weather at all. I'll take care of the weather. Now, how big of a blessing is that to a farmer? Say, all right, off my worry list is enough rain. (laughs) That's a big deal. So it's a huge blessing. And not only for their agricultural blessing, but I'll send enough rain so there'll be grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside to serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land produce uh, yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving to you. So he tells them, listen, this is what I'll do with obedience. I'll bless you in terms of the rain. If you disobey me and you force me to get your attention on this, then I know how to dry the rain up and get your attention. And uh, the Lord can, can the Lord uh, control the weather patterns of the world. He certainly can. He's the creator. That's just the creation. So he knows how to get people's attention. Every once in a while, there's a, you know, kind of a, uh, a natural catastrophe will occur in, in the world. 
And uh, sometimes a prominent uh, Christian leader or two will uh, stand up and declare to the world that this is God's judgment against the nation or against, uh, you know, the sin of the people and, and that kind of thing. And uh, I'm always pretty hesitant to uh, certainly to say that and very, very hesitant to believe that. I think God gets blamed for an awful lot in, in that vein that he has nothing to do with. It's a fallen world. The world was perfect when he created it in its original creation. It's fallen. These things that happen all around the world, they're a result of the fall. And so to pull his reputation in and have his reputation tarnished on the basis of what is a consequence of man's sin, got to be pretty, pretty careful there. But at the same time, he can dry things up to get people's attention or do anything in a nation to get people's attention and, and to affect their prosperity, affect even their food supply in, in order to turn them back to him. So that is that's on the table. It is it is something that he can do. He can look at a part of the world or a, a, a group of people like with the Canaanites, where their evil has become so uh, dominant that that it is not only destructive for them, but has the potential to then influence the world around them, the immediate world around them and around the world and he can he has his ways of naturally uh, you know uh, dealing with them and judging them and nature is one of the ways that he can control uh, to do that therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes and so again we saw this back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 he's saying in light of uh, how high the stakes are, how much is riding on obedience and disobedience. He encourages them to do the single greatest thing that we can do to kind of strengthen us toward obedience or encourage us towards obedience. And that is for our lives to be dominated by the word of God. And for every single one of us as Christians, the Bible should be, as we saw back in chapter six, the by far, single greatest dominating influence in each one of our lives. Television, radio, games, media, what, blogging, whatever kind of things that you know people are into today that are uh, that can be used around the world to fashion people, to fashion our thinking. Nothing is to to approach the influence of the word of God in our lives uh, for it to fashion us into what God wants us uh, to be to be fashioned like. And so when he talks here about putting these words in your heart, in your soul, bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets in your hand. He's saying, let the word of God dominate your thinking. Let the word of God dominate your emotions, your feeling, how you process life. Let it dominate how you process what you see. Let it dominate uh, all of your doing. And someone might say, well, we went, we went through all of this in chapter 6. I mean, uh, why in the world would he repeat that? So all the way back in chapter 6, we talked about the importance of the word of God being the single most influential thing in our life, importance of that. And so how many of us went home that night and said, all right, that's, a, that's quite a challenge from your word, Lord. Does that characterize my life? And then if it did, we said, praise the Lord. If it didn't, you made changes in your life to make sure that it would be that way. And then maybe there's some portion of us here this evening that it went in one ear and out the other and uh, nothing changed in your life. And the word of God still isn't the dominant influence in, in, in your life. Now you know why he repeats himself, because <laughs> he knows what he's working with. So if you didn't hear him back in chapter six, you want to hear him tonight a lot. You win or choose, you win or lose, rather, by the way you choose. Ansylvania, right? OK, the importance of of obedience, where it takes us in life and the importance of the word of God to uh, make sure that our decision-making is godly and what it should be. You shall teach 
the word of God. Teach these things to your children, speaking of them when you sit uh, in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. In other words, the word of God was just to be a part of everyday life, everyday conversation in the family. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, the, our walls of our home or whatever, the, it, it, our, our house, the things that belong to us, our sanctuary in life should be one that is done in a way that it is encouraging our faith in the Lord and not not tearing us down. And so, as again, we saw in chapter six, these same exhortations. I, I love what Paul wrote to the Colossians. He, and he said, let the word of God, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's what he's talking about. Just the word of Christ, the word of God, just dwelling richly in our lives. And as that happens, a byproduct of it is going to be obedience and then walking in the fullness of what God has uh, for us. That your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of uh, like the days of the heavens above the earth. And so it's just, just do it. It's just do this. There's blessing on the other side of this. And I like in verse 21 because it it's not, doesn't characterize our culture anymore. He said that your days and the days of your children might be multiplied. When God gives us commandments to his people, he's thinking about us. He's thinking about our generation. Thank you, Lord. We need, so we need him to be thinking about us. But he thinks about the next generation. And decision making in the United States of America, certainly on a national level, is not made with much consideration for the next generation and the generation after that. And but God, when he calls us to do certain things, he says, listen, these decisions, these uh, decisions that you make, uh, your obedience is going to outlive you, it's going to affect the next generation. And so for us, as God's people, we need to not just be thinking about ourselves, but the impact that our obedience then has on the next generation for their blessing. So this it's not, it gets us out of our selfishness. And it gets us thinking about things much bigger than ourselves, thinking about the next generation, which is to be like God and is to be healthy in our thinking. And it, it really it, it makes our decision making an awful lot better. So the Lord is, is good for us. It's good for our children that are going to follow us and our grandchildren that are going to follow after them. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out these nations from before you and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations uh, than yourselves. And so he begins to give them very specific blessings that would be theirs as a result of their obedience. And the first blessing, he says, is obedience will make you undefeatable. I know it's probably not in the dictionary. That's a good word. We make up words around here. It will, it, it will make them undefeatable before their enemies. And, and so he promises you obey me and you don't have to worry about wars that you're going to go into or battles that you go into. That you're going to be operating from a vantage point of victory. There won't be any doubt to the end of, of the battle. Now, how, what kind of a blessing is that? Some of you are military or ex-military. How terrific would it be going into a battle, knowing we are right with God, we are obeying God, and to know, I already know the outcome of this battle. We will win it. That's pretty valuable stuff. And so the Lord promised that to them. And then he said, uh, he spoke about how obedience would give them uh, enlarged borders. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the Western Sea shall be your territory. And so he speaks about if you obey me, this is ultimately going to be the land that you will possess. Now, this is a very, this is a very, very large. He's talking about having all of the land from the Mediterranean Sea to the river Euphrates. 
they would possess. If they had been obedient, they would have possessed that. And then north and south. I mean, I can get in trouble geopolitically here by talking this way from the Bible. It's interesting. You think about if the children of Israel had been obedient to to the Lord's commands. And these would have then become their indisputable borders. Think about how different the world that we live in would be tonight. That their obedience was going to, or disobedience was going to have repercussions all the way down through human history. The whole world would be different if they had obeyed. And then he said, is if they would obey him, he said, Behold, I set before you today. Oh, hold on. Verse 25. Third blessing. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon all the land where you tread, uh, just as he said to you. So he said, you obey me. You go into the land and I'll put the dread of I'll put dread and fear in these people of you uh, even before you come in. Now, you remember Rahab when when Joshua sent the two spies in there and and these two spies went into Jericho. and They met up with Rahab, who was a harlot there in Jericho for sanctified reasons. And uh, she spoke to them and said, we are all terrified of you and your God. We've heard about what what he has done for you. And God was already keeping this promise, putting that kind of fear in their enemies. Now, when you head into a battle. When your enemies already fear you in that way, that's a tremendous advantage in the battle. Then when they would go in and ultimately possess the land, it would become kind of a defensive thing where if all of their enemies around them, God has put a supernatural fear in them of the nation of Israel, it would keep them from constantly desiring or, or, or wanting to attack the nation of Israel. And so these, these are great, great blessings. I mean, it save you a lot in your military spending uh, that, that this obedience would have produced uh, for them. Then verse 26, he said, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. It's their choice. Here's the blessing. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, uh, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. And so he just lets them know that, uh, there, you, that there's, uh, there, there are two ways put in front of you, a life of blessing or a life that's cursed. It was their choice and it was all determined by whether they obeyed God or they didn't obey. Obey God. And so there's personal responsibility here. They would make the choice. They would deal with the repercussions. Nobody could call God unfair. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Now, it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal beside the terebinth trees of Moray? So um, for you will cross over the Jordan and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you and you shall possess it and dwell in it and you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. And so he speaks about uh, Mount Gerizim or Gerizim and Mount Ebal and we'll see later on in Joshua chapter 8 where a portion of the children of Israel stand at one mount. There's a great valley between the two but not too great that they can't hear one another. And then there, and another group of the children of Israel would be over here and one would pronounce the blessings of obedience. The other would pronounce the blessing of, of disobedience, the curse of, that comes upon disobedience to 
to God's word and uh, in that whole symbolic reading of of these things, it would remind them of the importance of obeying God's uh, word and the blessings that obedience would bring. And then uh, if they disobey, God would uh, send curses upon them. Now, we have it. Uh, things are much easier for us as Christians in this new covenant because we have. Because of Jesus, the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we don't need two mountains. We don't need groups of people shouting back and forth. Do you know the Holy Spirit can shout? You ever had him shout inside of you? No, it's just me. Okay. All right. I knew it, Lord. It's just me you treat this way. No, he can take and, and look and we find ourselves at a fork in the road or whatever it might be. And he reminds us. Of the blessing of obedience there. And he can remind us at another fork in the road of the, the curse or the danger of disobeying him. And so we've got something, a greater voice that lives right inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 12. And in chapter 12, uh, as he continues this sermon, uh, he instructs them now as the children of Israel, he instructs them on uh, the uh, the establishment of a central uh, sanctuary in the land, one one great single place in the land where he would set up the tabernacle and later uh, the temple that they would uh, meet with him. And so here you've got really in chapter 12 all the way through chapter 26, you've kind of got a main division that occurs in the second sermon. And from chapter 12 through 26, he just starts to go through a hit list of a bunch of very, very practical things uh, that he wants them to know some things he's going to repeat that have been mentioned earlier in the law. And then other things are going to be new things that God hasn't spoken of before. There'll be some elaboration, but he's just going to start to go down the list and say, OK, this is important to me. This is why this is what I want you to do in this situation This is what I want you to do in that situation. And the thing that I love about it is all of these things that he heads through, they're very, very highly practical and uh, and I like practical. So. So here we go in verses uh, this whole entire uh, chapter 12. The Lord instructs them about a, a set place of worship that he's going to establish in the land of Canaan. And there are the statute. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land, which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all. All the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the mountains and on the hills and uh, under every green tree. Now, the Canaanites and other uh, religions in the promised land before the children of Israel went in, they did most of their worship. And a lot of it was very, very sensual. They did it on mountaintops or they did it on hilltops. They did it on high places because they believed that their gods lived on the high places or their gods were more powerful on the high places. So these are places of worship where kind of terrible things have been occurring for generations there. And God says, I want you to go in and wipe all of that stuff out. And notice the strength of his his words in verse three. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such Things. And so God said, I want you to destroy it all. I want you to burn it. I want you to grind it to powder. I don't want anything left of it. Why? Because I don't want you to be tempted to take their practices and then introduce it into my word. And, and what I've commanded you, a relationship with me should look like from my word. So nothing of their idols, nothing of their religious paraphernalia was to be borrowed and incorporated into the worship of the Lord. And I think it's a contemporary uh, warning. I think it's a warning that needs to be spoken of uh, today. And every so often, I mean, the body of Christ is um, just every few months or few years. It just seems like the new fad comes down 
uh, you know, the the road and this is the new thing that everyone's into. And this is going to be the thing that, you know, gives us intimacy with God and gives us power in the world and revolutionizes the church and and, uh, you know, brings revival to the church. And so often when you look at the practice, it's brought from the outside. It's borrowed from some kind of pagan Origin. There's a guy talking to me a couple of weeks ago at the back door on Sunday morning, and it's uh, uh, back door conversations are fun. And uh, but he uh, he's just a just a regular Joe Blow Christian, just like me, just like you. And he comes up, and and I I know when I know when somebody's kind of putting me to the test a little bit, but I don't I don't view that as a negative thing. So he he comes up to me and he said. Um, what do you think about prayer? Wow, got about an hour. I mean, that that's a really big. Can you help me out a little bit on that? Any specific kind of thing like this? And and I said, well, it's fairly uncomplicated. Uh, it's talking with God and it's communicating with him. And however, you know, we, what we want to say to him. And, and, and that's basically uh, what it is. And so it's not a and then he mentioned, well, what about this practice and that practice and a couple of things that he mentioned? You know, they have kind of, uh, you know, non pagan or non Christian origin and that kind of thing. And um, I said, no, it's it, it all that is at best. It complicates things. And, and at worst, it's bringing something in from out there that that now makes this thing called prayer something far more complicated than the simple thing that God wants it to be. And so this kind of stuff is going on all of the time. And he just he just didn't want to come to this church if I was going to be emphasizing that as a, a way of prayer and that kind of thing. And I understand people struggle today on that stuff. The Lord just looks at it and says, don't bring any of that. Don't help me out. Don't complicate this relationship. Just do what I'm saying here in this book and don't bring any of those other things in. The pagan world has nothing to offer us in in our worship to the Lord that we don't already have in spades. We got a Bible that's going to inspire we got a Holy Spirit that fills the whole world and the universe and lives inside of us. we got truths that I don't care how smart a person is, it will, they will fry your brain. If you just take them out three yards, we are so rich in what we have in Christ. There's nothing we need to go out there for. For are already been given to us what's good and what we need in Christ Jesus. I, I have appreciated through the years of saying that I heard... Very, very early in my Christian life. And and the saying went uh, something like this. We don't need any new truths. We merely need new experiences in the old truths. And I believe that you look at the book of Acts and you see, wow, the dynamic of that and the power of the word, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of fellowship, the power of prayer, all of these different things, the excitement of the life and the fruitfulness of it. And the answer is we don't need to go out there, but to go deep into those things ourselves. That's that's the answer. That's where these things will, will be found. And sometimes people get feeling stagnant in their relationship with the Lord. They feel like they've lost a certain dynamic. And so they start hunting around a little bit. And, and the solution isn't in trying to find something out there that God missed, that somebody else saw, or some other religion saw, and now it's to be brought inside here. It's, it's to go deeper in a fresh way uh, into the things that are already Revealed in in the scripture. And so God God is saying through Moses, this is how I want to be worshipped. And I don't want you borrowing anything from the pagan world and and how they worship their gods to be brought into this relationship with me. Then in verse five, the Lord speaks now very specifically about establishing one central place uh, of worship once they enter into the land of Canaan. But you shall seek the place which the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling, the tabernacle at that point in time, later uh, the, the temple itself, and there you shall go. And so the Lord uh, says through Moses that he's going to choose a site for the tabernacle. And uh, you remember what, what's the tabernacle been up to this point? It's been mobile. 
It's moved. Every time the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night moved, that tabernacle moved. And the reason it moved is because they've been a wandering people in the wilderness. That's going to change now. They're going to go into the promised land and they're going to establish homes and cities and all these kinds of things. And so now the tabernacle or a central place of worshiping the Lord, one location that, that that's going to be, God says, I'm going to go ahead and establish that. And the tabernacle would uh, ultimately uh, reside for a time in Shechem and then in Bethel and then in Shiloh. And ultimately the temple, as we go through the Bible, will give or the tabernacle will give way to the temple and, and, and that the Lord uh, in, instructed to, to be built in the city of Jerusalem and it would be built by David's son uh, Solomon. Now, to have one central place where they would worship God would have made them very distinct among the nations in those days. And certainly the Canaanites and the Hivites and all the different people in the land because they worshiped their gods all over the land, anywhere there was a hill, anywhere there was a mountain. So God says, no, we're just going to do this in in one uh, central place. And I think that he did it as a protection against a couple of things. And he'll get into it a little bit later in the chapter. One of the protections, I think, is it was he did it as a protection against individuals becoming too independent in their relationship with the Lord. And, and so God says, I'm going to have one place where you come and you meet with me in terms of of sacrifice, in terms of priesthood, in terms of the furnishings, in terms of the offerings, all these kinds of, of things. And, and because he knew that in their heart, if he just left it wide open and they could worship God any way that they wanted, anywhere that they wanted, then anywhere there was a high hill or anything, they would probably abandon the tabernacle, abandon the furnishings, the priesthood, the sacrifice, and all of these kinds of things. And so he says, I'm going to establish this in one place. This is the place where you will come and meet with me supremely. Sometimes I'll, I will uh, encounter this a little bit. In Christians, this idea where, um, you know, it doesn't really matter where we meet with uh, with God. I can worship God is is every bit as much here in my backyard as I can at the tabernacle. And I don't see why I I need to miss a perfectly good football game to go down there uh, anyway. And I, and I think that what is true, uh, while it's true for us as Christians, that there really isn't one supreme place in the world that we make pilgrimages to. There's no one supreme place that is more geographically more holy than any other place. Jesus said that, that, that we worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And, and the Father is seeking those that will worship him that way. We can worship him anywhere in the whole big wide world just as is equally as long as we do it in spirit and we do it in truth. We do it in in reality. And so everywhere is equally holy uh, to us. Every place is a place to worship the Lord and, and to live for God. The Bible at the same time also teaches that we're to be a part of a local church. In Hebrews chapter 10, it declares, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. So it was a problem even in the early church, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And so the Lord calls us to fellowship together like we're doing tonight like will happen all through the week in different home fellowships and, and uh, uh, you know, different Bible studies and, and fellowship groups and the, these kind, uh, kind of things. The Lord doesn't save us so that we can kind of become these lone ranger Christians here on the earth while we're on our way uh, to heaven. He has designed things in a way that is intentionally designed to keep us connected with other Christians And the Bible is just full of instruction uh, concerning what is to be the focus and the structure and the importance of the local church. And 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 it is to be a place that every single Christian is to uh, have a part in its health and in in its success. So as Christians, we have this um, 
this personal relationship with the Lord. That's great. That's, that's the most important thing. But that personal relationship is to be lived out in fellowship with other Christians in the context of the local church. So we need each other. I need you. I'm glad you come out on Sunday nights. I need a church to go to. I need people to fellowship with. I need people to pray with. I need people to talk with. Just being together in the same rooms and encouragement to my spirit. Hunger for the things of the Lord. Coming together and saying, Lord, what are you going to do in our midst here tonight? What are you going to do as we worship you and as we study your word? And we really, uh, we, we need that. And, and I, I certainly uh, need that very much and maybe more than the, the average person. And so this is something that, that God has called us to do. I, I, in, in 28 years of walking with the Lord, I have never, ever known a single Christian who refused to assemble with other Christians in a local church. I'm not talking about people with health problems or things like that. That's a different thing. But a person who refused to assemble with other Christians, to, I've never known that individual to make any significant difference for the advancement of the kingdom. And there's reason for it. And the reason is, is we need each other in order to do that. We work together as a team. And I, sec- I think the second reason that this assembling together at the place that the Lord commanded is important is it would keep people from thinking that they're free to come up with their own man-made ideas about how to worship God or how to approach God. And God says, I-, I know what you'll do. If I don't, if I don't put a, a tabernacle and later a temple right here in your midst and declare that you need to come here in order to worship me in the way that I prescribed in the Old Testament, you'll start to approach me independent of sacrifice, independent of blood, independent of priests, independent of all of these things that are a picture of, of my son that I'm going to send into the world. You'll make up your own goofy thing. And you'll bypass all of the, the things that make it possible to approach God. And so he says, no, nope, this is what we need to do. Needs to be a central place. And uh, again, some variation for us in, in the New Testament. Um, but we need Christian fellowship also. And so this, um, this is the place, one place, you come together, and, uh, and that's where I'm going to meet with you supremely. And this is the, the, the activities that were to be practiced there at this central place. There, uh, not, not, in your, not in your backyard. Uh, uh, there, at this, this place, you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, Uh, The heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice in all to do which you have put your hand, you and your household in which the Lord your God has blessed you. And so he said, I want this is the place where I want you to offer your sacrifices uh, to me. I don't want you to do it in your backyard. I want you to do it. In here, I want priests involved. There's a reason for it. So you bring them here and bring your offerings. And then eat your offerings, the portion that is yours there in that place as I prescribe. Verse 8. You shall not at all do as we're doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. So apparently up to this point in time, remember it's a, it's a two to three million person camping trip, so it's a pretty wild scene that's going on. It's orderly, it's decent in order, but one of the things that God commanded of the children of Israel during this uh, time of their uh, wilderness wanderings is, let's say you had an ox or you had a bull or something like this or a goat, and you wanted to uh, kill that animal, not as a sacrifice to the Lord, but just uh, for dinner, just just for food. Uh, He required that during that 40 years in the wilderness that you would bring that animal to the tabernacle and the priests would do all of the killing, uh, even non-sacrificial killing. So now when they're going to go into the land and they're going to spread out throughout 
uh, all of the land, Dan to Beersheba and beyond, and, and it's not going to be practical to go to the tabernacle to have the priest killing, uh, you know, the animal that's going to be eaten for dinner that night. So he said, things are going to change now here, and, and you're going to be able to kill your own animal uh, in your own backyard, non, non, an, non-sacrificial uh, animal. And then apparently there were some other things that were like gray areas that were going on that he doesn't go into the specifics of. But this central sanctuary is going to kind of clean that up. For as yet you have not come into the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in uh, safety, uh, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand and all the choice offerings uh, which you vow to the Lord. And you shall uh, rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants and the Levite who is within your gates, uh, since he has no portion nor inheritance uh, with you. So he's kind of recapping here in vor- verses 10 through 14 a lot of what he has already said, except in verse 12. He adds something very important to what he has said earlier, and this is something that's new, and that is he said, when you bring these sacrifices to me and you offer them as worship to me, he said, I want you to rejoice when you do it. So this coming to the tabernacle, the coming to the temple, the coming to worship God and give sacrifice to God is to be characterized by great joy. And uh, that's that's what he wanted it to be. He said, I want the nations around you to see the joy that is involved in in your heart in worshiping me in this way. There's a very strong a uh, beautiful draw when you see people worshiping the Lord, not because it's something that uh, somebody's forcing them to do or they've got a, a ruler and they're going to wrap your hands or something like that. But it's just uh, because we can't believe we get to worship our God. I mean, you think about our God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's come near to us through His Son. He's given us a way to have a personal relationship with Him. He has covered our past with forgiveness. He gives us power today to live a life like Christ. He's covered our entire future uh, and, and eternity because of Jesus. I mean, how great He is, how good He's been to us. And I mean... But these are the things that we have. And he said, now listen, the normal reaction of anyone that's alive spiritually at all to those kind of things is for their lives to be characterized by joy when they do it. I mean, in the in the worship service, it should get to the place that we have Mike having to announce no standing and jumping on the chairs during worship. Say off of the armrests. But I mean, that kind of excitement and end up thumbing through the bulletin or, you know, working the ear thing and just sitting on the hands and when's this going to be over? Look at the God that we get to worship. And so he wants it to be characterized in that way. You know, one of the things that is so great and um, it is there's a prophetic uh, element to worship. There's something even independent of someone like me getting up and teaching the Word of God, that when someone that doesn't know the Lord yet comes into a room and people are worshiping the Lord in the way that we were just worshiping the Lord, you sit there and you go, what in the world is this about? I mean, I can, you know, run through 18,000 channels on TV and not run into this. What is this? You can't put that together with a $150 million budget. The reality of that, people worshiping the true and the living God, and it impacts people. We don't do it for them, but it impacts people because they sense the reality. These people are worshiping a real God, and they're doing it in spirit and truth. It's powerful. So it's a blessing for God. It's a blessing for us, for sure, to be able to worship in that way. 
But it also creates kind of a hunger and a thirst and a curiosity in other people. And it's very attractive to them. And it starts to get their attention about this God that these Christians over in that place are are worshiping. And so he says, I want this to be something that is characterized by rejoicing. Take heed to yourself, verse 13, that you don't offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes. And there you shall offer your burnt offering and there you shall do all that I command. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord. Lord, your God, which he has given to you. So now he's moving away. He's just talked about um, all animals that were to be given to the Lord as a sacrifice. Those animals were to be sacrificed by the priests at the tabernacle, at the temple. Now he's going to talk in verse 15 about here you are, the hunter, and you've gone out and you've knocked out a gazelle and it's going to be dinner for the next three nights. What, what do you do about that? What, what, uh, what can you do about that animal? Now, remember, during the 40 years in wandering in the wilderness, they would have had to bring that to a priest in order to bleed that animal and, and kill it. And, and so here now he's going to say, all right, but now you're going to be spread out throughout all of the land. And uh, so when you go to, you know, uh, kill Bessie uh, for dinner um, or Wilbur or whatever, don't name an animal you're going to kill. OK, that's rule number one, I guess. So uh, you, this is how you need to do it. You may slaughter and, and uh, butcher and kill the animal and part it out and uh, then eat that meat within all your gates, your home. You can do that in your own backyards, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you the clean and uh, the unclean and the clean uh, may eat of it. So whether a person is ceremonially clean or uh, unclean doesn't matter. They can eat this at your dinner table of the gazelle and the deer alike. So you didn't offer gazelle and deer to the Lord. So we're talking about private uh, food. Uh, only you shall not eat the blood. Uh, you shall pour it on the earth like water. So he says you can go ahead and, and slaughter and butcher your own animals for your own eating, but just like at the tabernacle, you can't uh you gotta you gotta bleed the animal. You can't eat or, or drink uh drink the blood. And and elsewhere he told us earlier in the law the reason for it is the life is in the blood. So it represents the life of the animal. So when we talk about sometimes in the older hymns and sometimes even in the newer choruses and even when Christians talk, very often we will talk about the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And sometimes a person can look at that and say, wow, that's a little graphic. I mean, what do you mean the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from our sin. The blood of Jesus has provided us with forgiveness, the blood of Jesus. And, and, and when we understand it from, from the Bible, the blood represents the life. So it's Jesus' life given and sacrificed for us that has provided us with the forgiveness uh, of sins and with the atonement. And so that's how they saw it, and that's how it, it would be understood. So the blood was not to be eaten uh, in, in part, uh, ingested in any way. And you may not eat uh, within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd or your flock uh, of any of your offerings which you vow of your free will offerings or the heave offering uh, of your hand. But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses you and your son and your daughters, your male servant and your female servant and the Levite who is within your gates, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all to which uh, you put your hands. Take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in the land. And so he comes back and he says, now, listen, I'm telling you, you can sacrifice you, your own animals and butcher them for your own food. But he, he keeps repeating himself. But I, but you cannot take what is required by God's law, talking to the children of Israel, required by God's law to be offered to the Lord. You can't offer things to God uh, up in uh, Dan when when they need to be offered in Jerusalem by the priests. So he just knows that they're just going to there's going to be a tendency to just flip over and say, well, 
What's the difference if I just kill it and, and all and do it right here without making that long trip down to Jerusalem? And uh, the Lord doesn't want his, his system or his way of doing things that all speaks of Christ to be bypassed. And so he tells them this. An additional factor is, is he didn't want the Levites to be, uh, to be forsaken. Remember, when, when, when they would bring offerings to the Lord, um, God, depending on what the offering was, God would take a portion of that offering and he would give it to the Levites, one of the tribes of Israel. They did not have a portion, a geographical portion in the land. The Lord was their portion. So they were dependent upon for their own their sustenance, their portion of these different offerings that the the tribes were to bring or the people were to bring to the Lord. And ultimately, the children of Israel will abandon these things and the Levites will suffer and they'll be out working the fields just like everybody else. And so it'll be disregarded. There's always a reason for God's warnings here. But he reminded them, it's not just about you, but it, I've also chosen to supply the Levite in this way. When the Lord your God enlarges your border, as he promise, has promised you, and you say, let me eat meat. <laughs> so you say, yeah. So this is a, what, what's that, what was that uh, all meat eating uh, diet? Adkins, okay, here we are. Adkins people, verse 20 is your verse right here. Just right in the margin. Adkins. So I remember one time I was on the East Coast. I was at a pastor's conference and um, the, we were in a hotel and, and lots of pastors were there and uh, Calvary guys. And there was one guy, he came over. He's just a wonderful man. Just, I'm a huge fan of his. But he walked over from the buffet and he sat down in front of me. And I'm not kidding you. He had a pile of bacon on a plate that was 10 inches anyway. Just a mountain of bacon. I thought he was joking. It's like you take your four, you know, and get some eggs and make sure you get some melons in there and a couple of grapes and half a banana, you know. He's got this. And, and uh, so we're taught, he's going to that's all he's going to have for breakfast. So what in the world are you doing? It was my first introduction to the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet? You eat that for breakfast? And what does lunch look like? I mean, what, where are the paddles? You know, you know, for the thing is just going to be a walking heart attack. You pray, you pray a long prayer over that because I think you're tempting God. So, but he was into that whole thing at that time. A lot of people were too. And so, I mean, if you need a verse, I mean, if that's your deal, here's your life verse right here. <laughs> when the Lord your God enlarges your border as he has promised you and you say, let me eat meat because you long to eat meat. I long to eat meat that you may eat it. You may eat as much meat as your heart desires. God said that you may eat as much meat as your heart desires. As they told him, I don't, how many of you is anybody work for any of the steakhouses in town? Tahoe Joe's or Stuart Anderson's. What's the other one down the sis outback? Anybody here work in any of the any of those three steak or another steakhouse in town? Just on that. OK, Nobody. Nobody does. Look at that. Well, I'll tell you, if you ever do go to work in a place like that, you show this to the manager. Show him that verse. So you put that prominently right in the entryway of his steakhouse. You might get a raise out of it. You might get some kind of a bonus or something like this. This is biblical what we're doing here. If the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from your herd and your flock, which the Lord has given you, just as I have commanded you. And you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires, just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten. So you may eat them and the unclean and the clean person alike may eat them. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood for the blood is the life. You may not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it that it may go well with you and your children after you. 
when you uh, do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things which you have uh, which you have and your vowed offerings you shall take and go to the place which the Lord chooses. So again, he comes back and he says, all right, you can do what you want privately, but don't mix these things up. Bring your offerings to this central place and, and you shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all these words which I command you that it may go well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord. And when the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land. So it's it is a uh, God is saying when, when, when this is going to happen. It's the presumptive sale. It's the presumptive thing that that's going to occur. And so uh, you're going to go in there. You're going to be in the land. These are the warnings for it. I'm going to be in a place you've never been before. Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared uh, to follow them uh, after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not acquire, inquire after the gods of these nations you're dispossessing, saying, now, how did those nations serve their God? Uh, I will uh, I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination uh, to the Lord, which he hates. They have done to their gods. And uh, and then he gives an example of that for they uh, burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. And so that's what they did. Uh, there was the worship of a God by the name of Molech. Uh, in in those days, and uh, the Canaanites would take uh, this molek and whether in a uh, a stone form or whatever form it took in terms of its material, they would burn it, uh, raise the heat of it until it was uh, white hot, and then they would uh, the, it was the image of it was arms out like this, and then they would roll their newborn children into the arms of it, and the child would be uh, burned alive as an offering to the uh, to molek in order that molek would then give them fertility for more children, fertility for their crops and for their animals and this kind of thing. And so the Lord again comes in and says, these people don't have anything to offer you. You've got it already as good as it, as it gets. So reject uh, uh, everything and, and certainly reject uh, this, this kind of, of practice. God's penalty for child sacrifice, we saw earlier in the book of Leviticus, was death. And yet, despite his calling a, a death sentence upon people that would sacrifice uh, their, their children, Solomon uh, will build a high place for worshiping Molech on the Mount of Olives. And then later on, King Ahaz and Manasseh, both of them will sacrifice, Jewish kings, will sacrifice their children in the fire, offering them uh, to Molech. And one of the interesting things here is that this whole thing of when a culture or when a group, and they did that immediately before God took them into judgment and took them into Babylon. And it's interesting that it seems like with these people that God is dispossessing here of, of the pagan people, the Canaanites and the, the people of the land. But even when he tossed the children of Israel uh, out on their heel on, uh, from the land, that when they got to a place that they were sacrificing uh, their children, he says, that's that's it. That crosses a line. And uh, and and then he lets his judgment uh, fall uh, down uh, on them. So the sacrifice of innocent children at the, at the hands of their parents that God says, that's the last uh, straw that that's a nation that's crossed the line that. Uh, that makes uh, it a, an abomination in the eyes of the Lord and really a danger to the rest of the world. And so the parallels, I think, with abortion are, are obvious. I don't bring up abortion, you know, to make uh, anybody feel additionally condemned if you uh, have had an abortion. You know, it's sin, it's, 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 it gets more and more difficult because as sin or ungodliness becomes more and more the norm in the culture around us, 
Um, by the time so many of us come to know the Lord, we have engaged in so many things that if we don't bring them up occasionally, as we hit that kind of thing in the scriptures, we wouldn't talk about anything. So I don't mention it to make somebody feel extraordinarily uh, bad. I'm capable of any sin and more uh, and part of the uh, apart from the Lord. And I did my fair share uh, of sinning. So I understand uh, what the kind of thing that this can provoke. But I think it's worth it to me to at least bring it up to make us realize that this battle as it relates uh, to abortion. It's, this is not a political battle or it's it's a righteousness battle. And it's a part of being salt and light in this culture. And it's not a battle that we can afford to lose in the United States of America, where uh, children are just indiscriminately killed in the way uh, that, that they are. And so the importance of realizing that when a nation reaches a place where there is no longer a fight going on for the soul or for the conscience of that nation, that this is something that even the most hard-hearted person should understand is a terrible thing, not only in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of, of man, uh, then it, without that resistance, that nation will cross that line and, and uh, judgment will come. And I think, of course, as we see the enlargement of, of abortion, maybe you followed the uh, articles recently in Mexico where a lot of the countries that have resisted Poland, they've resisted uh, legal abortion now, but the pressure of the world is so strong to allow this freedom, this right, this thing that, that the dominoes are falling. And the problem is, is that the whole world is getting set up for God's judgment. If this is a line where God says, once a nation or once a group of people cross this, then they force me to pour my wrath out on them. And we look at the world as a whole where the numbers are absolutely staggering. We realize that when he does pour his wrath out during the Great Tribulation, there's Hardly going to be able to be anyone to speak up and say God has been unrighteous in, in doing so. So the importance of us to be living for Christ and to be an influence for for a proper influence for right and a resistance to what is wrong, not only uh, for our own sakes, but for the sake of the nation that, that we live in. And more, whatever I command you, he said, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it or take away from it. So, again, he, he does this uh, multiple times in the book where he warns, listen, some of these things I'm saying, God says, they're hard, they're difficult in, in some ways to, to hear and all, but don't change my word. Don't take away from my word. Don't add to my word. Don't, uh, in adding to the word, we think about the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees in the New Testament. The Pharisees were adders to the God, word of God. They added all of their uh, man-made traditions and they added all their rituals and all to, to God's command. So they made, uh, they made a relationship with God more legalistic than God wanted it to be. Way, way more legalistic. The Sadducees were the liberals of their day. So anything that was hard in the scriptures, they said, oh, that's hard. People won't want to hear that. So they would explain it away and uh, and minimize the strength of the passage. And uh, the Lord didn't like either of them. Jesus didn't either. He came in and he taught the word of God just straight up. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. And so the importance of, he says here, uh, obey it, obey all of it. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm glad to be in relationship with a God who knows what he's talking about and proves it every single day in every one of our lives is we just simply obey him. Let's stand together. If the worship team come forward, that'd be great.